What's going on, guys? My name is Steve. Thank you for stopping by my channel. Today, we're going to be reacting to When Britain Nuked America Twice. This video has been recommended to me so many times since I started this channel, but I have no idea what to expect here. I've never heard anything about this before. I was never taught about this in school. Surely, if Britain actually nuked America, this is something I would have learned about at some point in my life. It just doesn't make sense how... You know, one of our greatest allies would have nuked us and I would have never heard about it. And, you know, speaking on allies, the fact that we are still allies today and still very, very good friends, you know, Britain and America, you know, means that there's got to be something more to this title than Britain just nuked America. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me. But anyways, guys. This definitely seems interesting, and I'm excited to check this out. So let's just go ahead and dive in and learn about when Britain nuked America twice. In the 1960s, Great Britain nuked the United States not once, but twice. What? What? Fortunately for all concerned, the attacks were only training exercises. Oh. So embarrassing were these attacks that they were hidden from the American public for about 50 years as well as being strenuously denied to the American press for decades. That doesn't surprise me at all uh, that the U.S. government would hide that from the public. Uh, you know, I think all governments hide certain things from the citizenry, but I think the U.S. government tastes a cake in the amount of things they have hidden from the U.S. public over the years. And uh, it would be amazing to find out some of these hidden secrets that our government um, has kept hidden from us so long. But uh, wow, I can kind of understand, though, why they didn't want the public to find out about that, because it definitely makes it made them feel less secure, you know. So, um, but yeah, let's continue. As far as America was concerned, its defenses were 99 percent effective. But in simulated attacks, Royal Air Force bombers managed to penetrate U.S. airspace to launch nuclear attacks on New York City and several other important urban centers. How did the British manage to penetrate the world's most heavily defended airspace? The answer is surprisingly simple and consists of two words. Avro Vulcan. Vulcan. The Vulcan first flew in 1952, the team that created it led by Roy Chadwick, who had designed the famous Lancaster Heavy Bomber of World War II. A jet-powered, tailless, delta-wing, high-altitude strategic bomber, the Vulcan was the backbone of Britain's nuclear airborne deterrent during most of the Cold War, serving from 1956 until retirement in 1984. This is the story of Exercise Sky Shield, when Britain nuked its closest ally, exposing how the Soviet Union could have done the same for real. In wow. 1960, the United States decided to run the largest test of its air defenses in history. Exercise Sky Shield 1 occurred on the 10th of September 1960, and all commercial air traffic over the US and Canada was grounded amounting to a thousand US commercial flights and 700 general aviation aircraft, plus a further 31 foreign flights due to land in North America. Okay, so this is making a little more sense now. You know, so the US was conducting a test to see how strong their defenses were, basically. And, you know, their ally, Britain, you know, was going to take part in that and see if they could you know, get through those defenses. Okay, that, that makes a lot more sense now, <laughs> okay. The US Strategic Air Command would launch B-52 Stratofortresses and B-47 Stratojets to simulate a massive Soviet nuclear bomber force approaching North America from north and south. 360 U.S. interceptor aircraft stood ready to defeat these enemy aircraft, which numbered 310. Among those 310 aircraft were eight Royal Air Force Vulcan B-2 nuclear bombers. 
A flight of four flew from Scotland, while the other four launched from the British territory of Bermuda in the Atlantic Ocean. Oh. The American plan was to detect these enemy bombers by radar and other early warning systems. And then they would be intercepted and destroyed in simulated attacks by US jet fighters and missile batteries. The attacking bombers split their attacks between high and low altitude. The defending fighters did very well against the stratojets and stratofortresses, intercepting many of them. But the Vulcans proved more elusive opponents. The Vulcan flew at the highest altitude of the simulated Soviet bombers, cruising at 56,000 oh, feet. Oh, wow! One was successfully intercepted at this altitude over Goose Bay, Labrador, by a United States Air Force F-101 Voodoo. But the other seven Vulcans all managed to penetrate American airspace to launch simulated bombing attacks on U.S. cities. What? They then turned around and landed at Stephenville, Newfoundland. What? Wow! The question was, how had the Vulcan managed it? The answer was their highly advanced electronic countermeasures systems and the Vulcan's amazing maneuverability. For example, the flight of four aircraft that approached from Bermuda were successful because three of them put up a wall of electronic interference that prevented interception, while the fourth Vulcan carried out a simulated nuclear strike. This was all rather embarrassing for Strategic Air Command, which quickly buried all stories about British bombers having new yeah. U.S. targets and confidently assured the American public that U.S. air defenses were, as I said, 99% effective. 99% effective. However, the following year, the Americans invited the RAF to take part in Exercise Sky Shield 2. Perhaps the U.S. AF was determined to show that the Vulcan's previous success was only a fluke, a one-time only. Are you event. kidding me? Sky Shield 2, which occurred on the 14th of August 1961, was an even bigger event than the first one. Are you kidding me? So, so they failed the first time. So we're going to do it again, and they failed. The, is that what we're about to learn? They failed the second time. I guess so. I guess because they're twice. So, like, you've got to be kidding me, man! Wow. It caused 2,900 U.S. and Canadian flights to be grounded, affecting 125,000 commercial passengers. During the exercise, 125 U.S. and British bombers would be pitted against 1,800 fighters and 250 missile sites, and over 200,000 Air Force personnel from the U.S. and Canada. Sixteen and a half seconds. Now, continue. Yeah, but I'm still ready. Ready now. Brace your part here. Come up. Six up, standing by for action. Again, eight Vulcan B-2s participated, split again into two flights. One attacking on the northern route from RAF Lossiemouth in Scotland via Canada. And the other four aircraft on a southerly route from Kindley Air Force Base Bermuda. The B-47 Stratojets simulated low-level Soviet bombers. The B-52s would attack between 35,000 and 42,000 feet, while the Vulcans again operated at the highest altitude, 56,000 feet. Wow. At the massive NORAD, or North American Air Defense Bunker, at Colorado Springs, the U.S. top brass was joined by the RAF's Air Marshal Sir Kenneth Cross of Bomber Command and Sir Wallace Kyle, chief of the RAF Technical Training Command, to monitor the exercise. Just before 2 p.m., U.S. interceptors pounced on the B-52s, approaching at the mid to high altitude level. The Vulcans also came in from the north, and again, due to the Vulcans' high-tech jamming equipment, only one was shot down by an F-101 voodoo fighter. 
In fact, large numbers of U.S. fighters were scrambled, but they concentrated almost exclusively on the B-52s. When the Vulcans came over, the interceptors did not have sufficient fuel remaining to climb to 56,000 wow. feet plus and engage them. The surviving three Vulcans conducted their attacks successfully, turned around and landed at Stephenville, Newfoundland. The southern attack force of four Vulcans from Bermuda reached a position 50 miles off the U.S. coast before fighters were scrambled to intercept. Again, three of the Vulcans unleashed an electronic jamming screen that kept the attacking F-102 Delta daggers busy while the fourth aircraft crept round to the north and sneaked through. This Vulcan proceeded to land at Plattsburgh Air Force Base in New York. If this had been a real attack, New York City could have been reduced to a smoking, irradiated hole in the ground. Wow. Many of the Stratojets and Stratofortresses had also managed to evade interception and launch simulated nuclear attacks. Seriously? Not at the kind of success rate that the Vulcans enjoyed. In two massive exercises of eight Vulcans that attacked on each occasion, seven had got through to their targets, an astounding survival rate against the huge might of the US air defenses. Wow. Did he just say, did he just say seven of eight? Seven of eight. Goodness, man. That's crazy. The Vulcans showed that with the right aircraft, America could be laid wide open to a nation-ending assault, mm. something which the Soviet Union would have been very interested in. Fortunately for all concerned, the relationship between Britain and the United States <laughs> never changed from special to decidedly antagonistic, and the Vulcans never came in anger. The American government also tried to make damn sure that nobody ever found out about the Vulcans nuking American cities. The U.S. Air Force was very quick to deny rumors that RAF planes had once again successfully penetrated U.S. airspace. In fact, the U.S. government went so far as to classify all references to Vulcans included in the Sky Shield exercises. After all, if the RAF could practice nuke New York City, Washington DC, and even Chicago, the Soviets could do the same, if they could develop an aircraft as good as the Vulcan. Wow. As far as strategic air command was concerned, the Vulcan episodes had never happened, and the US was well protected, and that protection, as I said, 99% effective. The Vulcans' successful attacks on America were only fully declassified in 1997, long after the Vulcan had left British service. Wow, guys, this is insane that the government hid this from everybody for so long. What do you say, 1997? Wow, um, I'm surprised. I honestly haven't heard about this considering it's been declassified for what's that, 20, what is that, 26 years uh, this year? I'm just now hearing about this. Man, I can I can sort of understand why the government didn't want this to get out, kind of for safety reasons, kind of so the Soviet Union wouldn't hear about this at the time, but they also didn't want to look weak to anybody, including the American public. Um, but, you know, there's no telling what the U.S. government is hiding from us even today, you know. Uh, you know, I think about bases like Area 51. There's so much mystery surrounding these these bases. And, uh, you know, who knows what's there? Who know? And it's not just about bases. Who knows what different military operations that have took take place that uh, U.S. citizens have never even heard about, you know, such as what happened here. The very fact that twice they were able to get through and simulate nukes over New York City? Did they say Washington, D.C., Chicago? That's insane. I mean, literally, we're talking about tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of lives, because those are huge population centers. Well, in 1960, probably tens of millions. At this point, you would probably be a, well, no, you'd still be at tens of millions. Um, but all combined, that would probably be approaching 100 million when you think about all the displacement that would take place outside of those cities. But uh, guys, this was wild. Um, 
You know, this was so interesting, though. I'd love to hear more stories like this. So if you know of anything else that's kind of similar to this, things that have now been declassified, maybe that were things that the U.S. government didn't want us to hear about or things. Obviously, I'm trying to learn about, you know, Britain and Ireland. So maybe things that have been declassified on your end or maybe certain military operations that took place that are just really interesting. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for stopping by. Please click that like button. Feel free to drop your comments or suggestions about this video or others. And don't forget to subscribe to continue to follow me on my journey to discover my British and Irish ancestry. Until next time, guys, peace.